Scripture for this morning will be taken from the book of Amos, chapters 1, verse 1. Amos, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Jewish, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Morning, everyone. What a beautiful, brisk fall morning. It's taken a while to get here, but I'm thankful that it is here. In January, when it's 20 something degrees at night, I might not feel that same way, but right now, I do enjoy the fall. I think if you were to poll humanity, I believe most people prefer the fall. Winter, it's usually too cold. Summer, it's usually too hot. Spring, you can't really be sure of. So it's kind of like the three bears, right? It's not too hard, not too soft, just right. Not too hot, not too cold, but just about right. And Rod had mentioned this a few weeks ago, that we love looking at the leaves changing. But the leaves are dying. But even in that death, how beautiful God's creation is. The colors of fall are just beautiful. If you are visiting with us this morning, I know it's already been mentioned, and it will be mentioned at least two more times, once now and probably at the end of the service, you are our honored guest. We are so thankful that you've come out to worship God with us today. We pray that you will be edified as we strive to glorify our God. Amos, not Andy, just Amos. I'm going to give a little background about Amos so we can understand who he is. It was the book of Amos is written by Amos who prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel. Circa 760 to 750 BC. Yesterday I did the PowerPoint because if you remember my last one the words were like this big and I wanted to make sure that I had the proper size font so that everybody could see it. So throughout history, God used different individuals to proclaim his word and judgments on people. He's using people today, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. He's using them differently, but he is using them. Those who were prophets had a serious task foretelling future events. Every prophecy that was given was fulfilled. There is not a prophecy that wasn't fulfilled, proving that God is God. There is no time and space for God. He has always been, and he will always be. B. One of those great individuals was a man named Amos. The Hebrew meaning for Amos is to carry or born of God. The born isn't mean to be born, but born carried by God. That is the definition of Amos. Amos prophesied during a period of national optimism in Israel. Things were going good, right? I mean, it was just 
fabulous at the time that he prophesied. But below the surface, greed and injustice are festering. Sound anything like a society we know about? Right? You look out and everything seems to be going okay. But underneath the surface, not just of this nation, but virtually every nation, there's festering, there's stuff going on. It's like when you look at the duck on the pond, it looks so peaceful. But the feet are going 100 miles an hour. Hypocritical religious motions. Think about the world we live in. Think about all the different teachings. Think about all the different belief systems. Think about all the different ways that people say you can please God, get to God, honor God. If they're even trying, trying to worship God. Or all the other belief systems that are out there. They have replaced true worship at this time in Israel. They have replaced true worship today. They're creating a false sense of security. There are many people in the world today, sadly, and I mean this from the depths of my soul, sadly have a false sense of their place with God. Again, I love being able to do this. If you haven't been able to get here on Sunday mornings at 9.30, Rod is going through the book of Romans right now. We're finishing up chapter 12. We're getting ready to go in to chapter 13. And we were talking this morning about Ephesians 1, that all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. An individual is either in Christ or they're outside of Christ. There's no straddling the line. There's no almost in. There's no almost out. You're in or you're out. And sadly, so many people believe that they are in Christ, but they haven't obeyed the teachings of the word of God in order to be in Christ. And only Christ can get you saved. Famine, drought, plagues, death, destruction, nothing was able to force the Israelites to their knees. I think I'd have hit my knees during the famine, right? But God brought all this upon them. Remember, God only brought it upon Israel when they left him. As soon as they returned to him, he raised them back up. How sad it is that he has to put people through this type of thing in order to get their attention. Amos, the farmer, turned prophet, lashes out at sin unflinchingly. Men and women of God, when we are sharing the good news, we need to be lashing out at sin unflinchingly, not at the individual, but at the sin, because we all, each and every one of us, has sinned and still sins, each and every one of us. That old saying, hate the sin, love the sinner, that still goes today. So Amos was trying to mobilize the nation to repentance. What is the church trying to do today? We're trying to mobilize a nation to repentance. Amos, a prophet of God. That is our lesson this morning. Who was 
Amos. What do we know about Amos? We already had one verse read to us by Rod. Amos 1.1. He was a herdman of Tekoa. Think about this. You're a herdsman, and God calls you to be a prophet. Again, if you were here this morning, it, it, it marvels me how God, Rod didn't know what my lesson was going to be. I didn't know what he was going to be teaching in his class. But he was talking about in, he, in Hebrews, Romans chapter 12, about the different parts of the body. And he mentioned Reggie, myself, he mentioned himself. If you'd have spoke to me five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there's no way that I'd have ever believed that I'd have been standing up here proclaiming the word of God. Rod said he didn't know early on that he'd love teaching the way he teaches. God will grab you from where you are and use you for his glory if we get out of the way. Sometimes we're trying to hang on and he's trying to take us over here and we won't let go. Here I am. Send me. I don't want to go to Iraq. What if that's where he needs you? I don't want to go to Utah. What if that's where he needs you? I don't know why I'm on this job. I don't like these people. I don't like it. Maybe you're there because he needs you there. We need to be praying to God to open up our minds to understand his will for us and why we're where we're at. God has a purpose. He doesn't do things randomly. He doesn't make mistakes. And sometimes, sadly, it takes us longer to understand that. Let's look at Amos chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. God didn't pick him up and move him, but God used him. Amos 7 and verse number 12. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread, and there prophesy. Amos was called by God to go prophesy repentance to Israel. We as the church are called to preach the good news to our nation, to our communities, to our family members. What were some of the problems that Amos encountered? When we're out sharing the gospel, we encounter problems. Amos encountered problems. Let's look at Amos chapter 3, verse 15. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Remember, things were going well. Amos is prophesying God's word that these things are going to be destroyed. Turn over to chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Right? They were just relaxed. 
everything was good, maybe too good. Sometimes we can become complacent as Christians. Look at all that God has blessed me with. As quickly as you got it, you can lose it. As quickly as you got it, you can lose it. And trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused a seed of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. You sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. You drink wine from bowls and anoint yourself with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Again, they were so caught up in their lifestyle that they had forsaken God. We can get so caught up in our lifestyle that we can forsake God. I don't think it's the thing on the front of our mind because we're just caught up in what we're doing. But in the back of our mind, we have a lot of people that forsake the assembly. And I'm talking in Christendom. Well, it's not that big of a deal. I can miss Sunday morning because, you know, I got tickets to whatever or I'm going to be traveling, or there's nothing wrong with traveling. I've mentioned this before. I know others. When Lynette and I go somewhere and we're going to be gone on a Sunday, we strive to find a congregation of the Lord's people where we're at. Because wherever we're at, we want to meet with the saints. We want to fellowship. We want to partake of the Lord's Supper. We want to lift up our voice in song to him. People rarely leave God from point A to point B. It's not just a straight line. It starts slowly. You miss a Sunday here. You miss a Wednesday Bible study there. You haven't picked your Bible up in a week or two, but you know you're still good. You still have the blessings of God. Life is going well for you. And next thing you know, it's kind of like being on a boat that's not anchored. And you look up, and you were two feet away from shore, and now all of a sudden, you're way out in the middle of the lake. It happens faster than you think. This is what was going on with Israel. This is something as Christians that we need to make sure that we focus on so that we don't get caught up. Let's look at Amos chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Lack of morality. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl. That doesn't mean they're visiting, okay? To defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes, taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. 
This is Israel. Flip over to verse 5, verses 10 through 12. They had no morality. Chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate. What is it saying? They hate the one that brings to their attention what they're doing. How dare you bring to my attention my sins? Nobody wants to do that. And they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. As a Christian, have you ever been looked at in the wrong way because you're preaching the word? Absolutely. The Bible says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The world has got it twisted. They say, we tell them the truth, we must not love them. The truth is, we tell you the truth because we love you. Because we see you drowning. Because we see you in a condition you can't get out of on your own. We couldn't have gotten out of our condition. There's only one person that can get people out of the condition they're in, and that is Jesus Christ. He alone. Verse 11. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Nobody else in the world might know what sin we're committing. God knows. The Hebrew writer says that there is nothing hidden from him. Nothing. I don't care how dark it was. You could have had every drape closed, all the lights off. You, it could have been the darkest room on this planet, and he still knows what your thought was. What you, he knows everything. What about their apostasy? Their apostasy. Amos 5, verses 21 through 24. I hate, I despise your feast days. But I thought God was a God of love. He is. God is love. We only know love because God first loved us. His love is perfect. Our love is imperfect. So how could God hate and despise? Because God hates sin. And if we're not obedient to God, we're sinning. So if, if you believe you're worshiping God, just like they thought they were worshiping God, but you're not doing it according to his word, God hates that worship. He despises that worship. And I do not savor your sacred assemblies. I don't care that you're gathered together. The Bible says in vain do they worship me. Teaching his doctrines, the commandments of man. Verse 22. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your song. I've said this before. There's some a cappella groups that I listen to that aren't Christians. Boy, can they sing. But do you think when they're singing a hymn that God hears it the way he hears us? No. When our voices rise to God, he accepts it as worship. 
but you have people that aren't Christians sing that same song. God doesn't want to hear it. Verse 24, but let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Two quick passages, Matthew 15, verse 8. Matthew 15 and verse number 8. This is as true today as it was then. These people draw near to me with their mouth. Again, think about the way it's written. Those that have obeyed the gospel are called children of God. He's talking about these people. Who are these people? Those that haven't obeyed the gospel. These people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. One more passage, Ezekiel 33 and verse 31. Just a couple of books back from Amos. Ezekiel 33 and verse 31. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words. Kind of like what's going on here right now. But they do not do them. For their mouth they show much love, but with their hearts pursue their own gain. There's a lot of people that talk a good game. A lot of people. There are some TV evangelists that are very eloquent. But it doesn't matter how eloquently you tell a lie. And they are telling lies. And many tens of thousands, if not Many millions of people have been lost. What about Amos spoke of God's judgment? Amos spoke of God's judgment. Let's look at Amos 7, verses 7 through 9. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I said, I see a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. God cannot be a part of sin. He cannot have anything to do with it. Let's look at chapter 8 verses 1 through Six. Again, this is Amos warning Israel. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end is come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, 
you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals even sell the bad wheat. These people were horrific. And they were doing this to their own people, taking advantage of the poor. Judgment is coming. Amos chapter 4, verses 6 through 12. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you're writing down scripture, I'm just going to read the first couple passages. Also, I gave you cleanliness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. And he goes on. God is judging them, and they were not relenting. Judgment was severe. Let's look at Amos chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out. You dwell in Samaria or Samaria in the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. They're going to be ripped to shreds because of their stiff neck. And then chapter 4, verse 2, the Lord God has shown by his holiness Behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. So what is the conclusion about all of this? How does this relate to us today as Christians? Sadly, Israel had to learn a painful lesson. There are people living today that have to learn a painful lesson because of their unwillingness to obey God's word. Today we do not have prophets, but what we do have, we have preachers, we have teachers, we have people that are proclaiming the word of God and what will happen if people don't adhere to it. We have people today proclaiming the word. When you go out to your family, to your friends, when you're sharing the word of God, you're God's messenger. We have all been given a command, go. It literally means as you go, as we go through our daily life, we are to be proclaiming the word of God. We as Christians must not fall into the same mindset as the Israelites. Well, I'm good as a Christian, and you may be, and God has blessed me, and I'm sure that he has. So I'm just going to keep what God has given me 
and I'm just going to stay in my little cocoon, and I'm not going to go out and share his saving grace with others. I'm good. I'm safe. Well, there's others that are lost and that are dying. Somebody shared the gospel with each and every one of us. What if they didn't? What if you didn't have somebody share that gospel with you? Where would you be today? There's somebody out there waiting for you. They're waiting for me. They're waiting for some Christian. They're seeking. They're knocking. Who's going to answer the door? We must present ourselves approved to God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We as Christians must rightly divide this word. Again, this morning in Rob's lesson, I don't have regular TV, so I don't see these commercials, but uh, Rod was saying that some person had a commercial about uh, the golden age or something to that effect, and, and he's basically promoting a book of false doctrine on the television. How many people are going to order that book and be lost for all eternity? Unless a Christian who can rightly divide the word of truth go to them. Are you right with God? Are you right with God? This is only a question that you can answer. Nobody can answer that question for you. If you've obeyed the gospel, you answered that question. And your answer to that question at the time was no. Have you obeyed the gospel? It's one thing to know that you're not right with God. But if that knowledge doesn't move you to action, you might as well not know. Right? Yes. If I'm thirsty... And I know that through that door is water, but I don't go through the door, my thirst can't be quenched. If you're not right with God, and only you would know that, and salvation is on the other side of that door, you have to make the decision to go through the door. Why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Now is the acceptable time of salvation. If there's anyone here this morning that would like to obey the gospel, I know we always give this invitation, and I want to make it clear that you don't have to come forward right now if you feel uneasy about that. If you want to call a brother or any member of this congregation on a Tuesday, and say, hey, you know what? I'm ready to obey the gospel. You know what will happen? That brother or sister will get together. You'll obey the gospel. Because we're not going to put it off. Some people feel uneasy coming forward. You don't have to come forward. You can pull a brother or sister aside after the lesson and say, you know what? I'd like to hear a little bit more about how to obey the gospel. That's why we're here. We're here because we love God and we love you. And we pray that we can help you join us in our pursuit of heaven. If there's anything that the church can do for you, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus.